in to redress the balance in the O. In the United States, Secretary Marshall warned his countrymen that without American aid, Europe might turn to communism. Uh, the whole situation is critical in the extreme. Uh, but there's no doubt whatever in my mind that if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. And there's also no doubt in my mind that the whole world hangs in the balance as to what it is to be in connection with what we are endeavoring to put forward here. Thank you. Later, President Truman drove to the Capitol to put the Marshall Plan for European aid before Congress. I'm here today to report to you on the critical nature of the situation in Europe and to recommend action for your consideration. After long discussion over facts and figures, Congress approved the plan. So the bill was passed and large-scale American aid for Europe became a reality. Even before the Marshall Scheme, much-needed American supplies had been pouring into the ports of Europe foretaste of the flood to come. On the quays were piling the materials and equipment vital to reconstruction, the precious food vital to starving millions. To the discerning, this was not only a victory against want, but a victory for the right in its fight against communism. But for the needy, did it matter from which direction help came? After years of German occupation and Nazi dictatorship, Czechoslovakia had reverted to the principles of democracy. Once again, politics had become a matter for free and open discussion. Once again, every Czech was free to consider, choose, and then adopt the creed of his own choice. In the factories of Moravia and Bohemia, the workers had regained their old spirit of fraternity and unity. Once again, the trade unions had become a vital factor in the nation's administration. The government was predominantly socialist, under the leadership of a communist premier, Clement Gottwald. The premier himself was responsible to the president, Dr. Benesch, a veteran champion of his country's freedom. Then came a government crisis. On the 21st of February, members of the Czech Communist Party, the National Front, marched en masse to Prague's Town Hall Square. There, in drifting snow, they gathered to hear Premier Gottwald explain the situation. In his speech, the Premier declared that several members of the government ministers from three parties had resigned. To quote his own words, we want to solve this crisis in a constitutional, democratic and parliamentary way. We believe that a government formed from progressive democratic forces could fulfill the constructive program of the government. We suggest that the resigning ministers shall be replaced by new men who remained faithful to the original spirit of the National Front. Later, Dr. Benesch accepted Gottwald's terms. The Premier formed his new cabinet, and without further ado, this cabinet took office. Of its 22 members, 12 were communists, two were socialists, and eight were from various other parties. 
Later, the new cabinet attended its first session of parliament. Here, the premier outlined the pledged program. National insurance, a new constitution, and further nationalization of major Czech industries. But the first move was to pay homage to a missing member. One seat in the house was empty. Jan Masaryk was dead. A patriot and democrat, torn by conflicting loyalties, had taken his own life. Mahatma Gandhi and Jan Masaryk. The world could ill afford to lose such men as these. 